She is Senior Planner and Geothermal Program Manager for the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. So Penny is a key person in developing policy documents and district plans and the coordination of regional council geothermal responsibilities. Her talk is Managing Geothermal Resources under the Resource Management Act. Um, I'm Penny Dorman, I've um, worked for the Bay of Plenty Regional Council as Greg's just explained and I've been asked today to talk to you very briefly about um, the regulatory setting for geothermal management in New Zealand. Um, I've worked in local government for 20 years but I'm actually very new to geothermal, I've only worked in this space for about two years. So before I start, I want to acknowledge the wealth of um, knowledge and experience that is in the room today. Um, I think in terms of talking about our regulatory setting, there are a few things I wanted to touch on today. Firstly, I want to look back to the past because that's often the best way to, to move forward. And I think we've got some very interesting lessons in New Zealand that can help guide us in our policy moving forward. We have over 800 years of, of largely uninterrupted, continuous, sustainable use of geothermal resources in New Zealand. And that use continues today, and it's well recognised in many of our local communities, um, particularly in Rotorua here today, and communities like Whakarewarewa, um, Ohinamutu, Ngāpuna. While we've, I guess more recently in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s, that use started to change and New Zealand just looked towards uh, geothermal more as a tourism icon and also for the health giving properties of the geothermal resource. So that really started to change things and um, Rotorua is a really good example of a city that was built around those values, the tourism values and the, the, the values of the natural features. And the city basically was built around that and um, rather unfortunately was built on top of the geothermal resource which creates for us today a number of um, issues for us from a hazards management perspective. I guess um, by the 1950s the uh, demand for energy increased quite dramatically in New Zealand and, and globally and that really changed the landscape for New Zealand and geothermal developments. There are a number of large-scale uh, energy projects, hydro dams and geothermal developments in the 50s. Good examples of those are uh, Kawaro development in the 50s and also Wairaki and also hydro dams. This picture here shows um, Oraki Kurako Valley which I think was dammed in 1955 uh, to make way for the hydro dam um, Lake Oakuri. And when the valley was dammed the features were all but lost and New Zealand and the world lost two of the world's largest geysers at the time. So complete tragedy, the loss of those features. Wairaki is probably another really good example of that with the commissioning of the power plant, I think it was 1958, the first stage. The features in, in, in Taupo were all but destroyed, so big, big lessons from the past. And of course Rotorua, I know um, Rob Reeves is going to talk about this a little bit more um, later in the day, but this is an example of indiscriminate and unsustainable use of the geothermal resource, which had quite devastating effects on the surface features in Rotorua. The development really was happening in a complete vacuum of environmental policy and a complete vacuum, a vacuum of laws around geothermal management. The laws at the time were focused on energy consumption and how we allocate energy and they didn't take into account the effects on culture, on the communities and on the environment. And surprisingly, surprisingly to me, this kind of development continued even into the late eight, um, 1980s. I think um, Ohaki was commissioned 1989 
And this is a picture of um, one of the magnificent taonga or treasures for local tangata whenua that was affected permanently by the commissioning of a power plant. Um, and also another effect of that was um, long-term subsidence locally. Now, this all sounds like doom and gloom, and I of course want to acknowledge the um, significant economic and, and social benefits that have come from these massive developments. Um, that is a really, really important thing to acknowledge. But I think the other point is that the effects on our surface features have been long-term, they have been spectacular, and in some cases they are irreversible. In most cases they are irreversible. The, this era of, I guess, impatient and somewhat greedy resource development um, in New Zealand we called it, a lot of this was sort of think big kind of mentality. It led, I guess it galvanised New Zealand environmentalists, it galvanised the environmental community and it crystallised thinking around environmental management and really changed the psyche of New Zealand in, in terms of managing our natural and physical resources. And the consequence of that was local government reform. Two big parts of that were the establishment of, of regional and district councils in um, 1989 and the establishment of the Resource Management Act in 1991. Remarkable change in New Zealand. The RMA uh, basically replaced 78 different statutes and regulations. So it really turned regulation of our environment on its head. This diagram just briefly shows you how the structure of implementation of the Resource Management Act works. Central to the, I guess, the principle of the Resource Management Act is the idea of um, decentralisation or devolution of, of power from central government to local government. And that's been done through um, requiring local councils to implement the Resource Management Act. And we do that through our regional policy documents, such as the regional policy statement and regional plans, but also the district council um, achieves that through the district plans. We obviously have national direction in how we do that, and uh, also there are other statutes that are particularly important in how we discharge our functions. So good examples of that are Treaty of Waitangi Settlements which influence significantly how regional councils discharge their geothermal responsibilities. The Local Government Act is another good example of, of statute that influences our responsibilities. Regional councils' economic development responsibilities or role largely comes from the Local Government Act rather than the Resource Management Act. So we're working in a quite a complex framework, but essentially implementation Sorry. <laughs> um, essentially, implementation is happening at a regional and district council level. So what does the Resource Management Act tell us that we have to do? Well, I could probably talk for uh, 15 minutes just on this. Some basic principles, though. Sustainable management is essentially enabling development where the effects on the environment can be appropriately um, managed. And it's providing for future generations. A, an important change in the Resource Management Act was also a move away from managing activities towards managing the adverse effects or the effects of activities. And the Act also requires councils to demonstrate that the policies that we develop to manage the resource are efficient and are effective. So we have to do that through, uh, we call it a section 32 process, where we have to show that the way we've chosen to manage our resources is the best way to achieve our objectives. Public participation is a cornerstone of the Resource Management Act, even though some people are not too happy about that. But um, it is a really essential part of resource management, and I'm going to talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute. And finally, the principles of the um, Treaty of Waitangi. We have to have regard to those principles, 
And some of the principles, just to name a few, because I can't remember them all today, include things like equity, active participation, active protection. So they're strong, it's a strong framework from which to sustainably manage our geothermal resources. More specifically, how does the Resource Management Act provide for geothermal? Under the Act, geothermal is considered anything over 30 degrees, and regional councils are charged with the role of allocating the resource, either fluid or energy, and also managing the discharges to the environment of that fluid, or discharge, discharges to land, air or water. Under the Act, or the Act specifically provides for cultural uses, so uses in accordance with tikanga Māori, so traditional uses. So any of the traditional uses that are still occurring today in, for example, Rotorua, don't require a resource consent from the Regional Council. And finally, another key principle is the protection is a matter of national importance of significant or special geothermal features. And those features can be special for ecological, geophysical, or cultural or amenity uh, reasons or landscape reasons. So the Act recognises the full range of values that the community holds for our resources. This diagram illustrates essentially the different roles of regional and district councils. The regional council, as I've said, basically manages the allocation of the resource. So we're essentially um, responsible for managing geothermal in, in, in New Zealand. District councils are more involved in the provision of infrastructure and the consideration of amenity effects, things like you know, if you're building a power plant, um, what do the structures look like, um, how you're providing for access, pipelines, dust, noise, nuisance, those kinds of things. We do have overlap, similar but overlapping roles in some of these areas. So in particular that includes the natural hazards planning, also the management of natural features and earthworks. So regional and district councils really have to work quite closely together to ensure that we're not duplicating and that we are working efficiently, uh, as efficiently as possible. I'll now talk briefly about the key principles that we use in our regional policy documents for geothermal management. And I'll acknowledge here that 95% of the geothermal resources in New Zealand are managed by either the Bay of Plenty Regional Council, who I represent, or by Waikato Regional Council. Our policy documents are different in that they reflect different community values and different processes, but essentially they have very similar key principles for management of geothermal. And I'm going to talk about each of these now briefly. System classification is probably the most important way in which we manage geothermal resources. Essentially this is recognising that not all geothermal systems are the same and that um, we have to take a fit for um, purpose management approach. In doing that, in the Bay of Plenty region, we've got about 12 geothermal systems, and each of those is given a different class to recognise the different values and the different uses of that system. Rotorua is a good example. It's a special, managed as a special system, primarily for the protection of its surface features. Um, a, a low level of, of extractive use direct, for direct heat is um, provided for in our regional plan, but only if it can be demonstrated that the adverse effects on surface features are avoided. Waimangu is another example of a system with particularly special significant natural features and it is categorised as a protected system. Our policy documents essentially don't provide for extractive use in protected systems. And of course, 
The extreme, or the other end of the spectrum, is kawaro, which has been developed actively for over 70 years, which has very few surface features, and which is managed uh, with a focus on sustainable energy use rather than the protection of features or from a protective position. I think that that's probably, if you take one thing away from today, that's really, really important part of our, of our policy structure, recognising different, different uses, different values, different systems. <coughs> Integrated system management is probably another key um, uh, policy driver for us. This recognises that, in different, sort of, that the natural and physical resources of systems are interconnected. And also that within systems we have multiple uses and multiple users. So we need a single source of truth when we're allocating the resource. We need to have a single source of understanding about the effects of use on the resource and on sustainability. To do that, the, our reg regional policy statement, as does Waikato's regional policy statement, requires the development of system management plans for certain systems, in particular development systems or systems with a high level of use. So, as I just mentioned, these system management plans are intended to provide a single framework from which to allocate a resource in a, within a sustainable framework. Managing uh, the effects of activities through a resource consent process is a fundamental, a fundamental part of the Resource Management Act. I won't talk to you in detail about the consent process now because that's a topic all on its own. But essentially the resource consent process allows for an applicant to assess his or her application against the policies that apply to that geothermal system, consider whether that development is consistent with that policy direction, and also provide an opportunity to provide robust science I think I've called it good science there, robust science, um, to assess the effects of that allocation on the environment. And also part of that is enabling uh, the community to participate in that consent process. Sometimes that can slow consents down, but it also has the potential to provide much better environmental outcomes and outcomes for the community. Protection of significant surface features is another key driver that's consistent between our regional policy statement and that of um, Waikato's. To do that, we really need to identify where those surface features are first, and to do that, we need to have good information about the range of surface features in our region. We've got over 1,800 surface features in the Bay of Plenty region. And we're working with GNS Science at the moment to develop a methodology to consistently apply criteria to determine which of those features are significant and therefore what protection status they should have. And that is no small task. The level of protection that is afforded to the significant features is determined by the, um, by the system class so in a protected system, there is a, um, an expectation of a high level of protection for surface features that are significant. In a development system, the focus is on remedying and mitigating adverse effects. So how those features are recognised and provided for varies from system to system. Community engagement, as I said before, that's a cornerstone of the Resource Management Act. And the Act provides a number of opportunities for the community to be engaged in geothermal policy and in geothermal management. Firstly, the community has an opportunity to be engaged in the development of policy. The Bay of Plenty Regional Council is just about to review, or is in the process of reviewing, its regional geothermal plan for Rotorua. And a big part of that will be engaging with the community to hear their views on the management of geothermal resources in Rotorua. The public also have an opportunity to participate in the process and the management of geothermal resources through the consent process, as I've just said. 
And also, I think it's very important to acknowledge that in understanding the values of geothermal and understanding the values of surface features, we need to recognise Matauro and Māori, the traditional knowledge that communities hold, and we have to understand the reasons that people value these places. If we understand why they're valued, then we understand the threats to those places, and therefore we understand how to manage them better. And finally, regional councils and district councils are involved in community outreach, which has already been mentioned here today. And that's basically working with the community to raise knowledge and to raise understanding of the geothermal world, which to a newcomer like me is, is actually quite a complex one. So it's important to bring the community with us on our geothermal journey. To do that takes careful messaging, and, um, and that's, I think, quite a big challenge for uh, both for uh, policy planners such as myself, but also for scientists. So what is our overall sustainable management goal in geothermal management in New Zealand? Obviously, we're looking at the wider sustainable framework, and that's providing for future generations. <coughs> By classifying our systems, we are seeking the best value for the most people from our resource. We're using the systems for their best use. For example, in Rotorua, the best use is clearly to protect the surface features that drive the Rotorua economy. In Kawaro, it's an entirely different discussion. So this is about fit-for-purpose management. We also have the challenge of basing any decisions we make on, in management on really good information, going back to that good science. Um, there is a risk in a political environment that we work in for regional councils that decisions are forced upon us for short-term political gain, uh, or for good ideas that might seem intuitively right but haven't been backed up by science. That is a real risk and it is a concern moving forward and I think understanding the importance of good science in, in our decisions is essential.